Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Ball here, your favorite gun channel in beautiful, bright, Hanglish language. And I have a very special gun for you today that looks like a Remington New Model Army. But in fact, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a New Model Army. This is the Remington Old Model, or the Elliot Remington. Let me tell you the story of this beautiful gun. But it is quite interesting, because the patent date of this revolver is 1861, while the patent date of the New Model Army is 1858, which means that the Old Model actually has a newer patent date, than the new model. Oh, or am I mixing something? Oh no, let's clear it up. This is the story of the very first military contracts of the Remington firm. This old army revolver is in beautiful shooting condition. The barrel is just mint, it's really beautiful. Also the action is crisp. The main spring had to be replaced because it was broken and also the nipples were replaced for safety. This is a quite early piece. It was manufactured in August 1862 and delivered to the New York Arsenal. It has all the necessary military markings. The cartouche and the grip is worn, but all the sub-inspection marks are visible on the main parts. The action is smooth and the revolver is indexing perfectly. The bore is really good, the progressive rifling is nearly mint. So I happen to have a new model army as well, that's in my left hand, right hand is the old model army. And in fact, the new model army was not the first military revolver that the US government purchased from Remington. We differentiate the Remington revolvers delivered to the US government into three basic types. The first one is the Beals, the Beals Navy, 36 caliber Beals Navy and the, uh, the 44 caliber Beals Army. And then came the old model or Elliott Army and Elliott Navy. And then came the new model Army and the new model Navy revolvers. But before we carry on, let me thank you for your support. Your donation through Patreon or buying your authentic American Civil War percussion revolver cartridge boxes or percussion revolver cartridge formers or our US Arsenal stadias or our rubber printing plates for Arsenal cartridge bundles or our flintlock tools or powder measure sets, they all help to keep the quality of our channel high. Without you, this would be much more difficult. So thank you very much again. I have been using my original New Model Army for years now on international muzzle loading competitions, and if I am in good mood, I can shoot well above 9495. My charge is 15 grains of 3F Swiss powder, 24 grains of corn wet as filler. This will elevate the bullet to the level of the chamber mouse, and it improves accuracy. The bullet is a 457 pure lead round ball. The lube is Chariot's lube, an excellent choice for cap and ball revolvers.
And this is, ladies and gentlemen, a 457 round ball and 15 grains of 3F Swiss powder. This is a charge that I use for my, my new model Remington revolver for target shooting with great accuracy. And it seems like it is not working that well with the old model, which is quite strange. But anyway, it's not a bad group. It's absolutely not a bad group. It's within the size of the 9 ring, something around the 9 ring. I'm pretty sure that it can be improved with fine-tuning the powder load. Let's check it with the conicals. Elifelt Remington, the founder of E. Remington & Sons firm, died in July 1861, just a few days after they presented their first solid frame revolvers to US arsenal trials. It was William Anderson Thornton, inspector of contracted arms, who first checked their revolvers. It was a 36 caliber, navy caliber, Beals revolver. So the pattern date on their barrel was showing 1858. The Beals patent covered the loading lever that also held the removable cylinder arbor in place. This allowed the cylinder to be removed without a significant disassembly of the gun. The perception of the solid frame revolvers was very positive at the US Army. And the US Army, by the way, was not really picky at this time for revolver designs because they needed everything that they could both on the open market and for manufacturers. So they were quite happy that they found a new maker, Elifelt Remington, who was already an experienced gun maker by that time, and they were up to large serial manufacturing. So they were happy to receive the new designs. Remington reported to the US Board of Ordnance in 1862, April, that they are ready for large-scale production of revolvers. They promised 200 to 250 pieces per day. That's a large number. And they had very good prices. By that time, the Colt revolver cost the army around 25 US dollars. Well, Remington offered them for 12 US dollars. A better design for less than half the price. That's a good business. So Remington did not have to wait too much for the first order to arrive. And it happened in June 1862. It was 5,000 of Beals revolvers, both in 36 and 44 calibers, but most of them were 36 calibers. But not everybody was happy with the new player on the market. Colt went down with the prices as well. They decreased their prices to around 14 US dollars, which is quite close to the Remington price. And also they encouraged officers to tell negative opinions about the new revolver designs. And to tell you the truth, the Beals revolver was not perfect at all. It had some flaws that had to be repaired. According to a letter from a young lieutenant of the cavalry, John W. Jackson, to General Ripley, Chief of Ordnance, he stated that the Remington Beals revolvers are unsafe and completely useless arms. He had quite a few problems with the new design. First of all, he stated that they are unsafe to wear because there is no safety notch between the nipples, so the hammer has to rest on a live nipple on the top of a percussion cap, so if the gun fell, then it can go off. Second, he stated that the rammer, this is the rammer here, is too short, so it cannot push the cartridge deep enough into the chamber. He also stated that the thickness of the rammer is sometimes too large, which means that they cannot enter the chamber at all. And he also said that it is so loose that sometimes you have to just lead it by your fingers into the chamber. He also complained that the actions of some revolvers did not work at all when receiving them. After just firing a few shots, many of the revolvers failed. Many of the hammers could not be put into full cock, and in some cases the trigger could not release the hammer from full cock. He said the nipples were so poor that many broke when the revolvers were fired. According to the lieutenant, some of the cylinders could not rotate at all, and in some cases they did rotate freely even when the hammer was in full cock. This report was sent to Remington as well, that they answered in 1862 November. And although they felt that this criticism is an unjust criticism, that is only serving the interests of some kind of other revolver manufacturer, who could that be? They decided to make minor modifications on the original Beals model. And this resulted in the 1861 model, or the Elliott Army and Navy revolvers. The first issue to deal with was the absence of the rests between the nipples. They had two solutions for this problem. The first one was to replace the cylinders with the rebated cylinders, and then the, rest, the hammer can rest in between the two chambers. And the second was milling a safety rest just in between the two nipples, and this is what actually happened later. Regarding the rammers, Remington answered that their length is okay. They can push the cartridge deep inside the chamber. And if there were any problems with the diameter of the rammer, let's say it was bigger than the size of the chamber, then the revolver could not be assembled at all, so it cannot happen as well. 
regarding the nipples. They stated that they are manufactured the same way as Colt is making their nipples, so if they have bad nipples and the Remington revolvers, then there should be problems with the Colt nipples as well. So the quality should be something like the same. And this is true also for the action, because they said that the Remington action and the Colt action are identical. So if the Remington action is not perfect or not fit for military use, then the Colt action cannot be fit for military use as well. The military cartridges supplied to the Remington revolvers were manufactured with conical bullets. One of the makers was Johnston and Doe. They made their cartridges in the factory of Alan E. Potter in New York. They were combustible envelope cartridges. We have a beautiful reproduction of the Johnston and Doe bullets, thanks to Erasgon, who is making a mold for them. It's a very good quality mold. I highly recommend it. And we also have cap and ball percussion revolver cartridge formers and percussion revolver cartridge boxes for the Johnston and Doe bullets cartridges. So let's roll some and make some authentic shooting session. Rolling your own combustible envelope cartridges is really easy using your cap and ball cartridge formers. Here are the easy instructions how to do it. You need two pieces of cigarette paper cut according to our manual. You need a cap and ball former and its mandrel. A powder measure for 24 grains, a funnel, glue and of course powder and the bullet. Start with rolling the cigarette paper on the mandrel and apply a bit of glue just to the edge. Now secure it tightly. Apply a bit of glue to the top as well. Now place the square form paper on the top of the mandrel. And insert the assembly into the former. Turn the mandrel a few turns and then remove it. Now fill 24 grains of 3F Swiss powder into the tube. Apply a very little glue to the heel of the bullet. And insert the bullet into the envelope. Now your cartridge is ready for lubing. Just dip it into molten lube. So ladies and gentlemen, this pistol still can shoot. That's a very good group. That's a very decent group at 25 meters. Four shots in the size of a 10 ring, which is excellent. And this is, let's remember that this is the reproduction of the original cartridge, close reproduction of the original cartridge. And I have one lower here, but uh, 
that can be the shooter, that's not a problem. So after all these years, the old model Remington can still shoot. I love that. But what makes the difference between a Bills revolver and an Elliott Army and Navy revolvers? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's the loading lever. William H. Elliott received the patent on 17 December 1861 under the number 33392 for a new type of loading lever. The main feature of this loading lever that you can retract the arbor pin without releasing the loading lever. The main goal of this solution was to to be sure that the soldier won't lose the arbor pin, first of all. Second, it is much easier to take out the cylinder with the new Elliott type loading lever, like this. Let's see now the detailed differences between the old army and the new army revolver. First of all, the frames are different. In case of the old model, the threads of the barrel are not visible, while they are exposed on the new model. The old model lacks the safety stops for the hammer between the nipples, while the new model has them. The front sight of the old model is a German silver dovetailed cone, while it is a blade screwed into the barrel in case of the new army. The old model has a clearly visible channel between the barrel and the loading lever, while there is no gap between them on the new army. The hammers of the two revolvers are also different. And most importantly, the Elliott type loading lever allows the forward movement of the arbor pin without opening the loading lever, while it must be opened in case of the new model army. So the pattern date on top of the barrels of the Elliott Navy and Army revolvers is 1861 and not 1858, like in the case of the Beers revolvers, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, this modification was not approved by the US Army. In theory, this is a good idea, but in fact, it turned out that it's not a good idea at all, because the arbor pin could accidentally move forward upon firing or upon holding the gun in your holster and riding which is not really healthy if you pull out your revolver and you can't fire because you lose your cylinder. That is really, really not healthy. So the army was not satisfied with this method at all. So on the 3rd December 1862, they immediately asked or ordered the company to return to the original loading lever method. But in the meantime, Remington tooled up for the production of the Elliott loading levers and they had quite a few on stop which means that they had to find some kind of intermediate solution to solve this problem. So they added a filister screw on under the loading lever that could stop the cylinder pin from moving forward. And that was a good solution. This transition was carried out between January to March 1863 and on 17 March 1863 Remington received the patent under the number 37921 for the new model army revolver and this marked the end of the old model and the start of the production of the new model army revolvers. Altogether 3851 Elliott army revolvers were delivered to the US army and also another batch of 8000 transitional new model army Elliott army revolvers were manufactured and supplied to the US army until 1863 March. Let's see now the differences between the ballistics performance of the 457 round ball and the Johnson and conical bullet, both propelled with 24 grains of 3F Swiss powder. Let's catch the round ball first in a cardboard box filled with loose cotton, so we can see the deformation of the bullet during the firing process. It is interesting to see that the perfect cylindrical shape of the round ball is squeezed to be an elongated slug. This is caused by the chamber and the forcing cone of the barrel. Let's check the muzzle velocity now. The 24 grains of 3F Swiss powder resulted an average of 224 meters per second, that is 735 feet per second velocity. 
Let's do the same with the Johnston and Doe conical bullet as well. It was interesting to see the strong rifling marks, but they did not seem to be symmetric. This time I loaded the revolver with loose powder and the bullet, not united in a cartridge. Probably this was the cause here. The average muzzle velocity of the Johnston and Doe bullet with 24 grains of 3F Swiss powder was 211 meters per second or 692 feet per sec, quite close to the velocity of the round ball. So while the muzzle velocity of the two projectiles were nearly identical, the kinetic energy at the muzzle of the conical bullet was nearly 40% more. That's a huge difference. It was also much better in retaining the energy. While at 25 meters the round ball had 77% of their original kinetic energy, the conical bullets had 90%, which is a great difference. And more energy means more killing power. And the conical bullet was actually more accurate, so it is much better fitting the the needs of this revolver than the round ball. Seeing your black powder arms in extreme slow motion is a delight. It gives you good chances to see what is exactly happening when you fire your gun. This time I received some really professional help from Fotron, manufacturer of professional high-speed cameras, and their Hungarian representatives, Real Electronica Limited. With their valuable support, we recorded the old model army with a frame rate of 8000 frames per second and the impact of the bullet in ballistic gelatin with 20,000 frames per second. Let's see now what happens when the hammer falls. That's the point when the cap is ignited. The pressure blows out in the gap between the cylinder and the bore. And the bullet left the muzzle. Let's compare now the terminal ballistics of the round ball and the conical ball. Above is the round ball, below is the conical bullet. The conical bullet with its better shape, larger weight and larger kinetic energy easily penetrated the gelatin block, while the round ball got stuck in it. So the Johnston and Doe bullet was not only more accurate, but it was surely more lethal as well. The permanent and temporary cavities of the two bullets, however, are quite identical, and their energy transfer capabilities are inferior compared to modern expensive projectiles. So on the shooting day I fired 36 shots with the Remington and I did not apply additional lubrication to the arbor pin. But after 36 shots the free cylinder was still rotating freely, the action was still flawless. So I really have to say that the revolver proved to be reliable. Nor I had any problems with the arbor pin moving forward. This is an early model so I don't have the Phyllis screw here, which means that the arbor pin could in fact move forward if it wanted to. But it did not. Which tells me that probably this problem was rather caused by having the pistol in the holster and riding for a long time with a clean gun, of course, when the arbor pin can move forward easily, but not after shooting, because after shooting it, is, it, is, it, 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 it stays in place.
So ladies and gentlemen, I really hope that you enjoyed this little time travel again. If you like what I do, then please subscribe to the channel, like, comment and share the videos because that will help to grow my channel. Until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry.